the government has been quite transparent with regards to expenditures and the cost of these programs. They did provide an update of the expenses and the expenses linked to the programs. As I mentioned, on our side, it's important to have a plan. We need to have a scenario to assess the need for a monetary stimulus. In our next review of the monetary policy, we will provide a scenario. So if I understood correctly, in April, April was a difficult month. March, rather. March, difficult. April, more stable. Then there was a, a growth in the economy in May. So with what you've mentioned, the fact that there is no economic update done by the government, does this, does this hinder your work in any way? As I was mentioning, for us, the most important thing for our review of monetary policy is the government expenses. They've been transparent on the expenses. Many updates, expenses updates have been done when new programs have been introduced. For example, there's more in the CERB, less in the wage subsidies. What are your expectations with regards to consumer behavior after the crisis? And also, is there a change of behavior specifically with regards to the digital economy? These are hard questions. On one side, most consumers would be very pleased to return to a more normal behavior, to be able to go shopping if they'd like, to be able to do things normally as they did before the crisis. On the other hand, there will be permanent effects. For example, many people right now are ordering food and groceries online. And then it's being delivered. Many people are going to find this service to be very handy and they will be pleased with it. You also mentioned the, the digital economy. I'm sure that this crisis is going to accelerate a huge trend, a huge economic trend where new technology is changing the face of work, is changing what we do for recreational purposes, for fun. So it's, it's quite difficult because we're at the beginning of this, we're in the beginning of this process, and it will be important to better understand uh, what will be uh, more permanent changes. So maybe ask this question in a future meeting and I might be able to better answer. So, Ms. Wilkins, you were uh, shaking your head there. I don't know. Did you want in to give a supplementary there? Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Julian. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, just, just a comment before I, I start with my questions. Uh, uh, when $750 billion is being uh, handed in supports the banking sector at the same time as people with disabilities have not yet gotten a cent uh, in this country, I, I think that's why there's increasing resentment. Uh, People with disabilities are trying to put food on the table, keep a roof over their head. Uh, they've received not a single dollar. Uh, $750 billion, three quarters of a trillion dollars has gone to the banking sector with the, uh, with the results that uh, I mentioned earlier. $5 billion in immediate profit so far in the pandemic. But as you mentioned, uh, Governor Macklin, uh, 700,000 700, deferred mortgages uh, that all come with penalties and fees and 
and compounded interest charges, which means the windfall profits for the banking sector are going to skyrocket uh, later on in this year. Uh, so that's my comment. My, my question is more uh, on the issue of climate change. And thanks for uh, talking about uh, the importance of a whole of economy approach. Uh, I uh, uh, and Deputy Governor Wilkins mentioned the uh, issue of the risks of transition. We'd like to hear uh, how the Bank of Canada and you as, as new governor, how you evaluate the cost of climate change so far per year to the Canadian economy, what you think the, the cost is, and how do you see that growing over the next decade if we do not take uh, the, the action that is required to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, well, Governor. I'm not, I'm not going to give you any numbers, but um, I'll give you uh, some uh, different ways to evaluate that question. So uh, as Senior Gep Deputy Governor uh, Wilkins highlighted, uh, the most sort of visible, tangible risks are the costs of uh, extreme weather events. And we're seeing that with increasing frequency in, in sort of the eastern half of the country. Uh, that manifests itself mostly in uh, increased flooding, uh, in, in, particularly in the west, uh, also in the north. Uh, it's manifest uh, in uh, increased forest fires. And, um, you, you know, one way to measure the cost of that, I don't think it really it really captures the human cost, uh, but you could, you know, the Insurance Bureau of Canada can show you uh, the quite dramatic increase that they've seen in their claims related to extreme weather uh, over the last 20 years. Um, with with respect to the um, with respect to the you know uh, other costs, um, so you know. We're going to need to adapt to climate change. Some parts of climate change are irreversible. Uh, so we're going to have to invest in the ability to adapt to it. We're also going to have to invest, and we are investing, in mitigating the climate change. Um, and you know, those investments um, will cost money, but not doing them is going to be a lot worse than doing them. Uh, Mr. Julian. Oh, you're giving me extra time, yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I am. Uh, you, uh, you give the other guys four minutes, so I'll give you the same. Go wow, ahead. that's wonderful. Well, let's go into the issue of uh, offshore tax havens. The parliamentary budgetary officer a year ago evaluated the annual hemorrhage outside of our country and what should be tax dollars yeah, used in common. 20, $25 billion a year, and that's a conservative estimate, uh, he said. Um, for the Bank of Canada, is that a concern? Do you have a position on this hemorrhaging of tax dollars overseas? It doesn't create jobs in Canada. It doesn't provide uh, that uh, economic stimulus here that is needed. Uh, does the Bank of Canada have a position? Uh, have you made recommendations around that? Do you not feel that that, plus the complete absence of taxation for the web giants like Amazon, is something that government should be dealing with? Uh, Governor, uh, what you can beyond uh, what is the policy for the minister? Answer what you can. Uh, well, I think yeah, I think you've pretty much nailed it. I mean, the, the, these are issues uh, for the government. These are issues for parliamentarians. These are issues for the minister of finance. Uh, so uh, you know, they're, they're not really in the purview of uh, monetary policy. Okay. Before I go to you, uh, Mr. Cooper, I do want to come back to the uh, point that uh, Peter made in the beginning on the $750 billion support uh, to the banks. And I'll ask this to you, to you, Governor, because I think the there's some who will view that $750 billion in liquidity to the banks that it is going to the banks. Uh, is this not uh, money that flows through to businesses, to consumers, uh, to uh, others in society to uh, make the economy run, to make the liquid capital, the capital available uh, in these kind of times? I would like you to s expand on that if you, uh, if, you, if you could, because I do not believe we want the impression left that the government is just 
dumping money into the banks. We're not. It, we're providing a, a liquidity service to so they can provide loans. Yeah, I know, I'll Peter, laugh. you're raising your yeah. hands, but could you answer so, that? Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, your your understanding is, is very clear. Uh, and I'll ask Senior Deputy Governor uh, Wilkins in a minute to say a little bit about the evolution of those liquidity plans. But uh, liquidity programs. Um, you know, exactly as you describe, um, these, uh, these um, programs from the Bank of Canada, uh, as well as uh, other, uh, other uh, programs, uh, these are um, effectively loans. These are effectively providing funding to the banking system, precisely so it can defer mortgages. Um, precisely so it can uh, increase business loans. Those loans, those deferred mortgages, they have to be funded from somewhere. And particularly in March and April, funding markets were seizing up. Had the Bank of Canada not come in to provide that liquidity, which as you said, flows through to households and businesses in the forms of loans or deferrals, there would have been a massive credit crunch in this country. And that would have seriously exacerbated the seriousness, the economic impact uh, of this crisis on Canadians. That's why we came in. And that's why the government has come in. Uh, in the, and um, as, and here's where I'm going to turn to Senior Deputy Wilkins, as uh, conditions have begun to normalize in funding markets, um, our, our repo programs uh, are starting to run off, and, and uh, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins can give you some numbers to give you a sense of the order of magnitude there. Senior Governor, Deputy sure. Governor. Sure. The, clearly, we've tailored our programs to be right size for the problem uh, when it's occurring and not replace private markets when it's not, when, when the problem's resolved. And so that's why uh, our short-term uh, lending programs are lending for one year or less or buying securities one year or less have been rolled off because they were great to use when markets were dysfunctional, but when markets functioning was restored, they became expensive. And so as we, as we intended, uh, banks and other market participants just started to use, to use the, uh, the regular programs, uh, the regular private markets. Uh, I think that's extremely good news. You know, it's, trying to see how much is flowing through to people and what would have happened if we hadn't have done it. You need a counterfactual. In our financial system review, we have we did two experiments. They're going to be imperfect, but I would direct you to those. There's a chart 14 and 15 where, where we said, okay, what would arrears be in our worst scenario uh, that we have in our monetary policy report in April for households if if we had not uh, helped banks do the deferrals and if there were not the deferrals that had been put in place. And you could see that the arrears would have been much higher without that. We, we do a similar experiment saying, okay, well, what would have happened if there were no government programs to households in terms of, in terms of the, or in, in businesses in terms of their non-performing loans? Because that's not a good thing for the financial system, but it's not a good thing for businesses or people either. And so that's a way to get a sense of how much could we have helped. It's always hard to caveats around counterfactuals, but but we've tried to do that work, and it shows that uh, the effects are are quite large. The positive effects are quite large. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we will go to uh, Mr. Cooper. And my apologies, uh, Michael. You were supposed to be the second questioner in your list, and I jumped over you somehow. And then we will go to uh, Ms. Zerowitz. And I don't know if you want in, uh, Ms. May. Uh, we'll uh, give you an opportunity if you want in. Okay, uh, Michael Cooper, floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the governor for uh, appearing, and congratulations on your uh, appointment. Uh, I just want to ask uh, a few questions uh, to seek uh, an update on some of the uh, extraordinary measures that the bank uh, has taken to deal with truly an extraordinary set of circumstances uh, arising from uh, COVID-19. Uh, and in that regard, I would be uh, curious if you could provide a, an update on the provincial uh, bond purchase program and the dollar value of purchases under the program to date. Yeah, I, I'm going to turn directly to Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins, who was instrumental in setting that up. Go ahead. 
So you'll recall that we set this program up to purchase bonds of a term of maturity of between one and 10 years across all the provinces of up to 50 billion. And, uh, and uh, to date, we have uh, purchased $3.5 billion worth of these securities uh, through a, a third party asset manager. Okay, and uh, also uh, along the lines of providing a, an update, uh, could you also uh, provide an update with respect to the banker's acceptance purchase facility? For sure. Um, 